Ladies and gentlemen, we now have a panel discussion. The topic of the discussion will be realizing the Army's vision for the future. The panel will be moderated by Mr. Patrick Tucker from Defense One. Please welcome our panel members, Professor Dieter Fox from NVIDIA, Professor Marshall Eber, CMU, Lieutenant Colonel Christopher Lawrence, Army AI Task Force, Dr. Tony Stentz, Uber ATG, Drs. Ethan Stump and Dr. Stuart Young, Army Research Laboratory, and Lieutenant Colonel Jay Wisham, Next Generation Combat Vehicle Cross-Functional Team. Please join me in welcoming today's moderator and panel members. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good to be here. So, uh, fun, quick question for the audience. I'm Patrick Tucker, Technology Editor at Defense One. Who here knows the etymological origin of the word robot? Raise your hand. A handful. Some Europeans, which does not surprise me. Um, so it's a Slavic word, and it means slave or service, and it enters modern usage in 1920 with a play by a Czechoslovakian playwright named Karl Kipik, and the play was called Rosum's Universal Robata, and so the robata were this creation of the play's protagonist, a guy named Rosum, and he's kind of a Silicon Valley Elon Musk type. Uh, act one, Rosum has created an, an entity that can take over all human labor. He becomes fantastically wealthy. Act two, the robots have destroyed the economy and created uh, you know, civil strife. Act three, guess who's killing all the humans, right? So uh, I, I bring this up because I think it's important to remember that all of our fears and all of our projections about robots existed decades before anyone actually tried to make them, right? Uh, so that hope and that uh, fear, it's just sort of ingrained in the concept, but it's always projection. It's always just a, a notion that we have and that we have to conquer. And that's why I'm so glad to have this panel here today to help us talk about the actual difficult work of making things that can relieve the labor that particularly we're putting on soldiers that have been incredibly dangerous and, and uh, uh, difficult line of work. Um, and so with that, I would like to, let me start first. Uh, with, do we have Lieutenant Colonel uh, Lawrence here? It's you, hi, hi. Um, so, uh, when you look at this, all of these things here from an operator perspective, um, I wonder if you can, to start us off, tell us a little bit about what you want uh, Battlefield Robotics to give you in the next five to 10 years. And then we'll get into the difficult technical challenges of meeting those expectations. Jay, that might be your, up your alley if you want to go yes, take or Jay, this one please first, go ahead. but I, I'm welcome to chime in if you want. Why don't you, why don't you, why don't you take a stab at it real quick and I can, I can help augment it. Okay, sure. So, um, Battlefield Robots, um, essentially we need them to, you know, be an augmentation system for the, for the soldier. We need them to um, give us enhanced situational awareness. Mm -hmm. um, so these are some of the themes that we've seen. So they need to have some context understanding, be integrated as part of a team. And then ultimately, uh, you know, like I said, feed that, soldier, that situation awareness back to the soldier, the operator, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that you get this increased standoff capability, mm -hmm. increased survivability for the soldier. Um, these are all really good, I mean, overall themes that robots can offer mm -hmm. in terms of capabilities, right? So uh, reduce cognitive load for the mm -hmm. soldier, uh, especially if you have a good human soldier interface mm -hmm. um, where you have one soldier uh, that's interfacing with many robotic systems. Mm -hmm. um, but again, going back to the situation awareness of what is, what are they perceiving, right, in the right. battle space? Um, and then with that, obviously that's inherently going to improve uh, the survivability of the soldier, right? Yeah. To be able to apply facts much more rapidly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's well said, Chris. So uh, fundamentally, kind of the way I look at it, uh, I'm, I'm very much, very much like Kevin. I, a lot of the CF team members, we, you know, the Army made a decision uh, not to put technical experts or acquisition experts in, in the CFTs. We're all war fighters, uh, so we take a very different sort of approach. Uh, I kind of boil it down to a very simple set of things. Uh, as a commander, I would like to be able to choose when I make first contact with an enemy force, with a human or not. I would like to have that flexibility and option. 
so that I can elect to put an unmanned system, whether that's a UAV or an unmanned ground system out, an unmanned system out to make that initial contact, you know, that very tip of the spear piece. I want to be able to elect to, to do that on my terms. Uh, and that's where robotic systems really give you some interesting capability. What it also allows you to do, uh, and Chris kind of alluded to this, I start changing what the decision you know, process is for the human. Uh, how can I make better informed decisions faster than my competitor or my opponent? Uh, and again, a lot of this comes down to how do I make these choices in such a way that I'm preserving my capability and my forces uh, and then putting the enemy in a, in a very bad position. Uh, that doesn't always mean killing them necessarily, although you know, the plight lethality has solved more problems in human history than pretty much any other method, uh, rightly or wrongly. Uh, but it's that ability to make those decisions faster uh, and then choose when I make human contact. And sometimes you want to make contact with a human first because of the complexity of the task. Perhaps it's going to be in a very populated environment and there's going to be a sifting and a sorting of who the threats are and what's going on. Or perhaps your intent is not to have a kinetic engagement. I mean, there's reasons that you'd want to do that. But if you believe contact with an enemy threat is imminent, I, I would really like to have a robotic system out there that is increasing my situational awareness and then allowing me to make a choice on what is the most efficient way to deal with that threat that puts my soldiers at the best, in the best position to win. Okay, so uh, this gets at a lot of what we're talking about here today and a lot of what you see around this room because uh, core to that uh, hope in terms of what you can have that system do is perceiving, right? I mean, that thing has to make a lot of decisions about what it is experiencing and then relay that information to you in a way that's helpful. Uh, and this gets at the problem of, of robotic perception. Um, I don't know who is familiar with Rodney Brooks the roboticist that uh, invented is behind iRobot, uh, but uh, in the seven, he said he has this very good quote about uh, the evolution of robotic perception. He said, you know, in the 1970s, we thought that teaching a robot to see was going to be a, a summer program for a master's student, uh, and now it's taken us. We're, well, we're not done yet. We're not done yet. So let me turn to Marshall, Tony, and Dieter. What does machine vision look like in the next five years and in the next 20? I guess I'm the victim in the middle here. Yes. Um, yeah, I, th I think where we really have to go is towards a much more robust, general, semantic understanding also of the physical world around the robot so that they can, for example, interact with it, as Sid also mentioned. Mm -hmm. So uh, just to put this in contrast, we humans um, have this really good understanding, intuitive understanding of the world around us and how things work. For example, nobody here would be surprised if I open my hand and suddenly the microphone would fall down, mm -hmm. even though you might not have the exact equations in your mind, but you know how this works. Or, for example, I might not be able to tell you exactly the, how many ounces that microphone weighs or how, how long it is, but at the same time, I can interact with it in a very robust way. I can move it around, and if I bump on it, nobody's surprised that it makes that sound. So we have very good understanding and predictive models of the world that we then can use in order to interact with it. And in robotics, currently there's still a lot of focus on having exact models, kind of really physical understanding of these models, but the problem is with these physical models is that it's very difficult to train them, to adapt them, and to teach them. So I think what we need much more is, is how can we teach perception system over time and train them in the real world through experience. Mm -hmm. um, and um, as an extension of the real world, of course, um, I think one thing that's going to be important is how can we train them also in simulation just because it's very hard and very expensive to mm -hmm. train robots only in the real world. Mm -hmm. So let me mention another uh, aspect of perception in the future, which is this, this idea of embedded perception, let's call it that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is a, the following idea. Uh, I showed this example of semantic perception, semantic segmentation, which is a, a critical tool mm -hmm. uh, in uh, autonomy. Uh, and the idea there is to basically label pixels in images uh, as to the object that this pixel uh, represents. Mm -hmm. uh, and the way that works is that you have typically a neural network uh, mm -hmm. type of structure that tries to do as well as it can in labeling every pixel in the image correctly. And that's the kind of display that you saw. Mm -hmm. So that sounds great. Now, can you think of any application in the world where you actually want to label every pixel correctly? It simply does not exist. 
Okay? Uh, one of the major limitations that we have now is that the perception systems that we have now uh, solve a problem that is solve the wrong problem in a way. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't need to label every pixel correctly. I need to understand the scene only at a level that is sufficient for me to carry out the task. And worse than that, it is solving a problem that is harder than the problem that we need to actually solve. So what we need to do is to have a perception system that are actually developed and trained in the context of a task, mm -hmm. kind of task-driven uh, perception. Mm -hmm. uh, that is something that we don't know how to do at the moment. We know how to do this for simple tasks like grasping, for example. Mm -hmm. We don't know how to do this for more complex tasks like navigation. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think in order for perception to be truly robust, we're going to need an immense amount of data. And has been pointed out, uh, the labeling problem is, is, a, is a real bottleneck for that. And so I think we're going to need to leverage approaches that automatically label, automatically train models. For instance, we can have a uh, human driver that can drive a vehicle around and the system can determine that, well, it's a road that they're driving on and when they, uh, for instance, steer around something, that must be an obstacle. And so get very efficient classifications in, in that way. Uh, additionally, the robots can go out themselves in the environment and encounter it and, and automatically understand the environment that way. So for instance, if a robot sees something uh, in the environment and then drives over it, it gets much more information about uh, what was actually there and can use that to automatically classify the data. Uh, so this labeling problem is, is a big one, and if you look at some of the posters on the wall, uh, they remind me that one of the big uh, potential solutions to that that's emerged over the last couple of years is uh, deep learning. Uh, because you, in a, a deep learning system, the, the system finds its own labels to things in a way that uh, conforms somewhat to your predictions, hopefully. Uh, so why, Marshall, I'm going to stick with you for a second, why hasn't deep learning solved this perception problem? What's needed for it to solve this perception problem? Uh, well, I guess uh, three things. First of all, uh, deep learning has been very successful precisely because of the availability of data and the availability of, of labeled data. Mm -hmm. uh, so step one is, as Tony said, and as, as we said earlier, uh, is the ability to train those systems with minimal amount of data mm -hmm. and minimal supervision. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is critical. And in fact, this is something that completely separates uh, uh, autonomy from other application of computer vision where you have the luxury to uh, train those networks offline with massive amount of data and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, the, the second thing is uh, going back in time, going back to the time of uh, the Rodney Brooks quote that, that you had here, yeah. uh, and to be able to incorporate uh, uh, more structural knowledge uh, you know, additional knowledge uh, in those systems. Uh, we, we went very far into uh, the realm of pure le um, uh, data-driven learning, mm -hmm. pure black box system that basically uh, learn from scratch from data. Mm -hmm. uh, and that has gone very far, but we need to now step back and see how we can use additional knowledge, common sense knowledge, uh, geometric information, uh, knowledge about the task, et cetera, to, uh, to add to this uh, data-driven black box learning. Yeah, the, the, the black box thing is an important one because uh, neural networks, uh, it's, it's, they've actually been around for like a little bit. Uh, in the 90s, there was some very interesting work with neural networks and it was before there was like the really big data sets and before there was really great compute, but they, they were around. Uh, and I would, uh, I talked to a couple of folks that were trying to create an application for them in the public space, particularly like predictive policing, actually here in Pittsburgh. Like, a lot of people don't know about this. There was a neural network uh, uh, sort of uh, it, like project that was based on predictive policing here in Pittsburgh. And it worked great, but city planners and municipal folks were like, I don't know if I can want to adopt this because I don't understand how it made its decision. I don't know how it reached its decision. Because that opaqueness that was neural networking in the 90s and to a certain extent today was like a huge inhibitor. So I want to ask our, our operators here, um, if you don't fully understand how a system arrived at the decision that it made, how much do you trust it? And I want to go back uh, to you, Marshall, or anyone that feels like they have something to contribute to that. Is the black box opaqueness, is that still the best descriptor of the way neural networks are operating now, or have they evolved from that? So first to the operators, how much do you trust a, a neural network that you can't understand its reasoning, but you do see the output being correct? 
You know, I think it comes down to the soldier interacting with the system early on in the process and, and start practicing kind of the, the, you know, the teaming concepts that we're working on with manned and unmanned teaming. Mm -hmm. How do they see themselves interacting with the system so they can build trust over time mm -hmm. and understand the system's limitations, what its capabilities are, and what it can offer? Mm -hmm. And I think over time, taking that feedback too, mm -hmm. you know, from the soldiers saying that, you know what, this is throwing too many alerts. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't trust it. It's, these aren't accurate. Um, and then we might have to go back to the drawing board a little bit. But I think, you know, there's, there's, systems we feel that before that, you know, maybe somewhat as a black box to mm -hmm. the soldiers. So, I mean, we have means of, you know, testing and evaluation and simu mod through modeling and simulation. And, we, and we've already just discussed recently about putting some bounds and mm -hmm. some of the, cons you know, around the systems in terms of interjecting maybe physics models, mm -hmm. uh, you know, bounding necessarily what it can do in terms of its response. Mm -hmm. um, so I think with, there, there's means for us to tackle this problem. Yeah. I, w I, I, I think I would say it kind of depends on what the task is. So uh, I would just offer that everybody in this room, you put in an ordinary amount of trust in anything but from the time you woke up to the time you got here in something you can't actually describe how it works either. Unless you've like torn apart a car on your own and put it back together, you probably in theory understand how a car is working, particularly a new model car with the digital systems in it. But you, you probably really don't know. Like you have an idea. Mm -hmm. And by the way, most humans are not as explainable as we might like to think either if you've ever asked your 10-year-old why he did a thing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so from that aspect, a simple task, I think it comes down to demonstrative effect. Like if you demonstrate mm -hmm. a soldier that the tool or the system uh, that you're trying to enable them with mm -hmm. generally functions relatively well and adds some capability to them, mm -hmm. some minimal little level of capability, they will grow trust very, very rapidly. And in more complex uh, activities where you're trying to assist in de actual decision support tools or mm -hmm. um, you know, higher cognitive processes where you, like multiple complex systems together, uh, that is going to be a little bit more difficult. But again, mm -hmm. these are all uniquely human activities that you chain series of humans together and then you have these arbitrators that are again humans that are doing this. Mm -hmm. These are not always explainable either. Yeah. Uh, so I think that you can gain trust, but a lot of it's going to come down to what you demonstrate as uh, a capability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo that. You trust something because it works, uh, not because uh, you understand it. And uh, so the way you, you show it works is you run many, many, many tests, mm -hmm. and you do a statistical analysis and build confidence that way. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's true not only of machine learned systems, but other systems as well, if they're sufficiently complex. Mm -hmm. uh, you're not going to prove them correct. Uh, you're going to similarly need to put them through a battery of tests and, and convince yourself that, that they meet the bar, that they work. Uh, yeah, I fully agree also on the notion of maybe we have to let go a little bit of this idea that we can prove everything that it's correct and perfectly predict its behavior mm -hmm. just because the kind of data that we're dealing with is so complicated, right, that you mm -hmm. just can't explain it anymore um, at every level of detail. Um, and, and as you great pointed out is we humans aren't that great at explaining uh, why we're coming to our uh, decisions. Uh, also, we're not that good at that. Um, and also, I think in the machine learning community, there's, of course, a lot of work going on exactly in this direction where techniques are being developed, how you can kind of introspect these deep networks and kind of see why the network might come up with a certain recognition um, solution or something like that. You can mm -hmm. look at which part of an image led it to recognize a cow and things like that. And also, other areas are going into how we can put this physical structure, specific constraints into these networks so that they learn within the confines of mm -hmm. what we think should be physically okay. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of good progress going on. Okay. Uh, so let me turn to you, uh, Stuart, Chris, and, and, and Gary. The Army modernization priorities, we just heard a little bit about uh, those. And there is a bit of a gap between what uh, commercial industry is working on and what the Army needs. So how uh, are the Army modernization priorities shaping right now uh, AI research that you're doing? So the, uh, the, the, the biggest thing for me is they're enabling us to focus our research efforts on capabilities that the Army actually needs. 
and it also is an opportunity for us to inform them as we develop, as they develop requirements, we can help them understand what's technically achievable and what's a little bit further out. And we use their, this interaction to help us focus our research and um, discover new things that are of interest to them. Mm -hmm. So instead of looking at you know, a wider swath of problems, which we're always inquiring about, it allows us to understand and get deep into the area of interest that they have. Um, so the engagement with the NGCV, um, which is why I invited them to be here in such force, is because they've really adopted um, what we're trying to do in the CTA, and, and they are really helping us understand how they would actually use them in the field. And that's um, informing the research experiments that we have to do um, to meet the uh, requirements that they have. Mm -hmm. uh, so on this for, for Tony uh, with Uber, what is Uber doing right now in this space, and what are the lessons that uh, you learn from the RCTA that are applicable to your work in Uber, and uh, what, are the, uh, what can the military learn by partnering right now with Uber? Because I know that's something that they're talking about. Sure, yeah, yeah. So I would say there's a, a lot of technology that's in use, not only at Uber, but in the self-driving car industry. Uh, that uh, traces back to programs like uh, CTA, mm -hmm. uh, technologies that were either innova innovated on the program or uh, matured or extended in some way or another. Uh, I, for starters, a lot of the perception technology, for instance, uh, detecting people, detecting mm -hmm. pedestrians is very important. Mm -hmm. The multimodal approaches and machine learning approaches have been uh, very successful for doing that. Mm -hmm. um, other perception problems as well, I think there's a, a big deal made about the fact that self-driving cars use maps, and they mm -hmm. do, but there's an awful lot of stuff you encounter uh, in addition to moving actors like, like cars, pedestrians, and bikes that aren't in a map, mm -hmm. uh, things like a construction site. And so uh, when the car encounters that, it needs to have some understanding of what that is, so a lot of the semantic uh, perception techniques have been applicable there. Mm -hmm. um, prediction is a very uh, important um, uh, component for a self-driving car. The faster a car goes, the more time it needs to stop, mm -hmm. and therefore the more important it is to predict what other actors in the environment are going to do for the next several seconds. And so the same sort of machine learning techniques that, that uh, are used in perception are also used there. Uh, planning is, is another area, uh, routing technologies for getting a car from A to B uh, sourced in, in these programs. Um, a lot of local navigation approaches where the car has to follow a lane, stay behind another car, or uh, drive around something. Mm -hmm. uh, Uber uses sampling-based uh, planning approaches where in faster than real time, we investigate different sequences of steering, throttle, and braking commands and evaluate them and pick mm -hmm. something to execute. Right. Uh, so that's been, uh, been very successful. And then uh, other technologies as well. Uh, it's very important that the car uh, knows where it is at all mm -hmm. times. And so a lot of the technology that was developed in the extensive SLAM research uh, has made its way into, in, into that application in self-driving. Yeah, is, is that, are you guys working on something that's GPS independent because that's a big issue for Army, right? Uh, sure, yeah, yeah. G GPS, uh, for instance, uh, driving around in cities with uh, tall buildings, uh, GPS is not particularly uh, good yeah. at localizing, so uh, we've had to adopt uh, uh, multimodal approaches for getting the position of the car. Okay. Uh, Go ahead. Are you guys are, are you now exploring like a crater with uh, the Army? Is that a thing? Uh, certainly uh, have looked into uh, possibilities of teaming and we'll look into uh, more in the future. Okay. Uh, so, Ethan, what are the autonomy challenges that ARC has to focus on that industry won't focus on? And also, sorry for neglecting you for so long. <laughs> so, I think probably the number one task, as was kind of mentioned before, is that you know, I think we have to deal with unstructured environments, and there are certainly aspects where, you know, industry is interested in this, moving to off-road terrain. I think the adversarial aspect is the key thing that uh, the Army needs to face that industry might not necessarily face. And I think it's adversarial not in that, you know, we're worried about people trying to goof with the cars or, you know, mess with them, um, but just the fact that, you know, you need to operate in a place where people are deliberately trying to mislead you, deceive you, uh, outmaneuver you, and you need to be able to deal with that. Um, 
And we need to think about how we do this in a way that we have as little sort of preconceptions as possible. Um, we don't need to, we need to be able to adapt if the plans change. We need to be able to do this uh, without a lot of lead time mm -hmm. and be able to adapt as the environment changes and the mission changes. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I just came from, from AUSA, it was a wonderful big show. Uh, General Murray was there, the head of Army Futures Command, and uh, as well as a wonderful assortment of new uh, semi, uh, or not very much so, uh, but robotic tank prototypes for the you know, next generation combat vehicle. Uh, industry's getting out there and making this stuff that looks like it just rolled off the set from like Mad Max. But if you talk to General Murray, one of his biggest concerns, and I think this relates a little bit to the work you're doing, but also to the future applications of these in a battlefield environment, Murray's big concern was the network and whether or not the comms are sufficient to uh, create a situation where uh, an aerial drone, a ground drone, a semi-autonomous self-driving vehicle can all share enough data uh, with both the soldier and uh, with the folks in back of the soldier to allow for a successful operation. So that bandwidth is, is a huge concern of his. I wonder if you can uh, talk a little bit about how big, for the operators, how big a concern that is for you. And also, um, what role does intercommunication uh, at, among systems play in your work. I know we're talking about autonomous systems that are supposed to be thinking on their own, but until we get there, uh, there's going to be a lot of need for the transfer of, of video imagery and other imagery and just a big network that the Army wants to have behind these things. So talk a little bit about the challenge there. For stoppers. Yeah. Sure. So I think ultimately we've got to get, as you pointed out, it's a great question. Um, we know we're going to be operating in a contested environment. And we can't necessarily rely on our networks to transmit high bandwidth data, like full motion video. Mm -hmm. So we need to continue to push and develop our autonomy ability mm -hmm. for these systems to, if you will, get minimal guidance initially, mm -hmm. and then they move out, right? But then, of course, we know they need to adapt. And that's right. going to be one of the biggest challenges of these systems, yes. We're pretty good now, you know, in terms of adding waypoints to these systems and then autonomously navigating out to those waypoints, avoiding obstacles and so on, and reporting back. Mm -hmm. But in terms of situational awareness, how do they add value to the team? And as Jay talked about, the increased standoff capabilities, making contact first, mm -hmm. they essentially need to report back a, a salute report, Yeah. right? A situation, what's the size, what, what kind of class of the threat am I looking at? What's my confidence level? And then maybe a chip mm -hmm. image, right? A still right. image of that being relayed back to the operator in a common operational uh, interface where mm -hmm. you're getting this common picture, mm -hmm. right, of that. Um, and, and then also, uh, obviously, we need a geolocation, right, of that right. threat as well. But um, I, we need to continue uh, to push that in terms of research that we can't necessarily rely on and we want to move away from the teleoperation full motion video. Sure, there might be times where we could have that option. Mm -hmm. We want the full motion video or we want another still image. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can do that at times, but we need those systems to, to be able to function without it. I can augment this a little bit and talk about sort of what the current thoughts are about how network interfaces with autonomy and the use of robotics and autonomous systems. You know, now the military operates drones and we basically assume a full motion video link. And we know that that's not a reality. We don't have the bandwidth for that. Mm -hmm. but we're doing is we're thinking about how the networking actually becomes just another aspect of the entire planning process. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you don't need a lot of bandwidth if all you need to do is just, you know, recognize one small thing in the image. Like, it's, most of the image is actually useless for that. Um, so that task actually doesn't require as much bandwidth. And if you're going to be using, uh, if you're going to be doing a control task that requires a lot of sort of high speed reactive control and you want human space to be doing the teleoperation, you need more bandwidth. Mm -hmm. But if it's something that's low, low tempo, mm -hmm. uh, low impact, you know, you can get away with less bandwidth. And so there's a relationship between the perception and the control and the networking required. And so you actually want to live in the space where you're, you're balancing between those three, those three things. Mm -hmm. it, it points to understanding better what the task is and tailoring the, the communications to the task. Um, and then we can also look further and think about how the networking is not just a passive thing, that we actually are actively shaping the network that we have. I mean, the Army already does this. Uh, you know, every unit uh, from battalion and above, they're going to be equipped with a retrans station. So, you know, they'll put the operating post down and the radios only reach so far. 
but you have a unit that can go out and put up an extra set of antennas so they can retransmit the comms out to get a wider field across the battlefield. You know, we can use robots for that task. Mm -hmm. And moreover, we can have the robots be able to adapt to what, how the network situation is changing and replace and move around the retransmit capability based on what the needs of the mission are and how the mission is evolving. Mm -hmm. So you were going to have something there. Yeah, I was going to basically build on the point that Ethan was just talking about. So ARL, you know, we've, we've looked at this autonomy and networking communications as a dual, that the autonomy enables the, the communications through the active approaches that Ethan was talking about. And some of our recent visits out to NTC, um, they actually highlighted this. The, the battalion commander was like, hey, I'd, I'd love to have a robot just be able to do the retrans for me so that they can have the connections. And, uh, so I think, you know, this, this network, and then of course, as was already alluded to, you know, the autonomy is what I believe is so critically important to reducing the requirements on the network, uh, which we know will be huge and contested. So the more we can do on an autonomous fashion, the more, you know, it frees up, uh, gives us maneuver space in that network domain. Mm -hmm. I think there's, there's one thing that you don't want to lose sight of, um, and, and it sounds very simple, but the, the things that you desire to network in terms of these capabilities and this information you want to push, uh, to the, you know, the three or four or like, let's say three to like 12 human beings that are on board that platform and that's your raw numbers, right? You know, between the crew and then the, uh, like a dismounted squad in the back, for example. Uh, the information is critically valued, valuable to them whether or not that information is going off board that platform to some other, other node, for example. Mm -hmm. So a lot of these things that you want to apply some autonomy to or different functions and applications to, to the human beings on board that individual platform, even if that node becomes isolated from the network, can be critical to them. So we talk a lot about you know, the computer vision problems that we have in, in the frame of uh, artificial intelligence assisted target designation, recognition, and tracking. One of my favorite acronyms ever, by the way. Um, that is critically important to those human souls on that platform. The information you would get then when you'd want to pipe out to some other thing to provide this uh, sort of collective understanding, that's critical too. But I think that's something that we lose sight of is that there's a minimal threshold for capability that we can strive to. We all seek to go in this high you know, X, Y axis of uh, granular solution and complex environment. You all want to go in the top right because that's your bent as a, as from a research standpoint. That's really the goal. Uh, but at a real, real visceral level, there's real minimal capability that you can draw in. Mm -hmm. So network is a, is a critical concern, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But if I can solve some problems for that crew, that's better than what I have now. Right. And now, as I have more assurance in my network, as I build a more robust network, or we become much more dynamic in how we treat the network, generally through some very innovative AI applications that I've seen recently in terms of how you monitor a network mm -hmm. and then flow information to the right actor at the right time, you know, I'm just gaining more capability over time. But don't lose sight of the fact that network is a challenge, but to the crew on that vehicle, like mm -hmm. what you can enable them with, become, you know, that's life and death. Mm -hmm. So think, think about questions that you might have, because very shortly we're going to go to the audience for, for questions. And if you start coming up with them, raise your hand and I'll find you. And uh, I think that that would be good. But I want to bring up something that you mentioned a moment ago, Ethan, which was uh, this uh, challenge of dealing with all of this stuff in an adversarial environment, in a data adversarial environment. Uh, who, here, who here knows what a GAN is, a generative adversarial network? It's for all, you're all like roboticists, so you do. Okay, that's great. Um, for folks at home that are, that are watching, it, it's basically a, a means to, um, it can be a means to spoof a data set, right? You can, you can uh, use it to test whether or not a data set is true, or you can also use it potentially to inject uh, faulty data into a data set and, and create an impression that is, that is wrong. The uh, NGA right now, the National Geospatial uh, Agency, is very worried about uh, some research that's come out of China that applies that methodology to spoofing pictures of the world, right? Spoofing like geolocation data, like satellite photos of this place or that place. And so they're trying to get ahead of that. But I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, first, uh, to Tony, the data integrity problem at Uber in the commercial space uh, and how lessons there, but also the data integrity problem in the military space, uh, particularly with this, uh, you know, this issue of autonomy in these environments. And that's kind of, the second part of that is kind of a jump ball to whoever feels like they can tackle it. But I guess the, 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 there are lots of different types of data at Uber, but uh, uh, you know, one of the um, 
most important kind is to get uh, representative data of all of the situations that uh, the, uh, the car can encounter as, mm -hmm. it, as it drives around so that you uh, come up with models that properly represent everything that the car will see and are not overfitting to any uh, particular situation so that you would do uh, very well uh, in some areas but then struggle in others. So mm -hmm. certainly uh, data integrity in that sense is very important. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, how, generative, like adversarial attacks on data integrity. How is the military looking at that? What are your worries and uh, what are your solutions? Particularly in terms of autonomy and vision. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, it's clearly a really important question, right? We, we see this more and more fake, even generated videos out there that when you look at them, you feel like, yeah, that's, that's correct. And it was someone who was actually saying some very different words and you just can generate videos that look like someone said mm -hmm. something that they actually didn't say. Um, I, I think one way forward will also be just to make sure that the data that is being collected, that we can keep track of that data, like what is the origin of an image, when was it taken, how was it taken, and then make sure as it goes through these different computing processes that we keep track that nobody really tampered around with them. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the same time, yeah, you mentioned GAN and a part of, of, of GAN is of course the, the discriminator network, which is the job of that network is exactly to distinguish between fake generated or artificially generated data and real data and maybe these kind of lines of, of, of dis discriminators trained specifically for these purposes can help with that problem as well. You know, if I can just chime in here for, you know, I think the military were, you know, we've already had the structures in place in terms of, you know, protecting our data and I think as long as we know that we, we're, we have to have the proper security measures for this data because if we want to protect against things like GANs, right, you have to have either the data or the neural network because you have to have, you know, the adversarial network pitted against the discriminator in right. order to basically find the vulnerability. So hence, you have to protect your network and you have to protect your data. So this is something of, of interest, obviously, to the military. But I think we have the right structures in place to be able to do that. Okay. Yeah, so we talked a lot about uh, corrupting the data set, basically, but there's another way to uh, adversarially uh, corrupt the, the performance of the system, which is to generate input that will uh, adversarially uh, change the output of the neural network. Uh, mm -hmm. This is something that is being studied extensively in the context of face recognition, mm -hmm. where you can uh, present an image that is not necessarily a fully realistic image, but will produce a recognition output that is basically what you, the adversary, want. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, an even more uh, concerning uh, problem because then you don't have to mess around with the data set basically. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is to figure out how the network operates on input output and be able to fabricate inputs that are not necessarily realistic images mm -hmm. uh, necessarily, but that will produce the output that you, that you desire. Mm -hmm. uh, there is extensive research on that topic, both on uh, how to uh, extract, uh, how to identify those vulnerabilities and how to build networks that are immune to those uh, vulnerabilities. Just a quick point from, you know, from an operational perspective, we, uh, the chart that Kevin put up earlier where you, you had that kind of, uh, uh, climb of what, it, what a machine would do, what a human would do, and then really where's the sweet spot of what you do together. And, and we, we view this problem as uh, how do you cue a human to help assist, augment, and interrogate an object mm -hmm. uh, to, to kind of you know, make your way through some of those, those problems. So basically that would be your uh, next generation camouflage, if you will. Like you're not camouflaging necessarily from a visual uh, you know, perspective like you would you, you know, in, in traditional military sense. But it could be something as simple as you know, pixels or you know, scrambled images on board of a platform that then produce an, a, a result you don't want from an, a system. But a human, if cued to look at it, can assist in the classification of that object. And that's what we think is one of the, again, it's what's the threshold of, of right? It's probably where's that human in the loop uh, for that teamed activity between a human and a machine. So let's go to the audience for some questions. We've got a little bit of time left. And uh, you know, uh, you've got a fantastic panel here to interrogate in terms of their, your hopes and fears and expectations of the future of military and uh, their adaptation and adoption of machine vision. So um, uh, shy, OK, Get a little bit shy. Oh, wait, here's one right here. Yes, yes, they do. They are coming up right, right there. Thank you. 
Hey, good oh. afternoon. And oh. please, please uh, name your affiliation as well. Yes, I'm uh, Lieutenant Colonel Matt Kukla. I'm with Future Vertical Lift. I'm the Modular Open Systems Approach Lead. Okay. So although our problems are very similar on the battlefield, the solutions may be very unique. Um, one of the things with MOSA that we all have to do for open systems architecture is, um, is make sure that we're standardized um, so that we can get the uh, rapid adaptability and the high systematic reuse of our components for hardware and software. That being said, a lot of people here working on unique solutions. Are you guys using as essentially a baseline um, Stainag 4586, Arink? Uh, how will the U.S. military be able to uh, pull these from 6162 all the way into S&T and then beyond that into uh, production? So I can speak what our plans are for this program specifically. So the pathway that we've outlined is we've been working with the Ground Vehicle Systems Center. So these are the folks that own the Ground Vehicle Robotics Portfolio for the Army. And what they've done is they have put forth that the Army should standardize for ground vehicles around uh, ROS. So if anybody's familiar, everybody has at least heard of ROS, they should be familiar with it. And they put forward what they call ROS M, which is ROS military, uh, to kind of play off the idea of ROS industrial, where a large industrial consortium got together and said, what are the important aspects of ROS that we need to focus on? What are the capabilities we need? And how do we sort of decide which packages and standardize the interfaces between them? So ROS M is an effort to essentially build a business model, which is around modular systems. It speaks to the modular open systems architecture. Uh, so GVSC has a, I, I think of it as a reference architecture, which essentially says here are the basic building blocks of a of system, and this is built upon, you know, a host of programs they've done over the last decade. You know, starting, Stuart showed the, the chart of the flow of things. These things are all interconnected when it comes to ground vehicle robotics. You know, so we're actually in the process of moving things from our CTA into that, and we're proposing modifications to that, because that's very much the architecture that was kind of what came out of RCTA 1, and we've learned a lot of things since then. We have this entire intelligence architecture, which goes from language and reasoning and ties in perception, and so we see those as things that are augmenting that, and so we're going to be folding those into the reference architecture that then, you know, for ground vehicle robotics at least, we'll be able to build upon. So that's the strategy that, that, uh, that we see forward uh, as a path forward for ourselves. Right there. Yep, so uh, Shad Reese, uh, Senior EOD Robotics Technologist out of uh, Indian Air, Maryland. Question on standards. Does the industry have standards and are they bleeding over into the DOD for us to leverage for test and evaluation of all these technologies? So, yeah, we're, so we're, we're tracking on the same topic. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess we, we certainly have standards, uh, we, um, uh, but I, I would say that we're using our own architecture that, that is proprietary and homegrown. Here, I'll just repeat for the, for the camera. Uh, what are the names of the standards? So there's been work with what was called JAWS, and um, you know, I, I don't really know where that stands. You know, a lot of the work that we're showing here in the CTA is pretty foundational. Um, and, and, and related to your question on the uh, testing side of things, you know, when these systems become more and more autonomous, there's, I wouldn't say debate, but there's definitely recognition of the need for getting, a, doing a better job of understanding how can we test these systems. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're working with ATEC and, and the different testing agencies to help inform them on how you might go about doing these, um, even to the point where, you know, what is, what is the definition of developmental testing and operational testing even mean when you're talking about systems that continuously evolve and learn and reason? So. Um, as, as was discussed earlier in the understanding of, you know, is a system good or trust, you know, there's um, approaches that we worked on in the autonomy COI across DOD to basically say, hey, look, you know, we're going to have to think about this problem differently. The, um, the analogy is more recognition, like, of, of your child or 16-year-old, whoever has a 16-year-old learning to drive, and there's no guarantee that they're going to ever, you know, avoid a wreck or an accident, right? But they demonstrate certain capabilities and they demonstrate enough for you to convince the DMV to give you a license. Um, so it's, it's not a guarantee, but it is evidence-based, so you have some level of trust. And so Tony was talking about this earlier. So I think we're going to have to um, get past um, perfect testing of every edge corner case because that's a fallacy and, and time in, on earth doesn't permit that. 
So we're going to have to think about that differently. Um, related to the um, standards, this is something that um, actually Chris and I are talking a lot about trying to figure out how can we do this, um, you know, across the AI task force and ARL and, and informing this ROS and G GVSC community to uh, standardize on these interfaces, what are the right interfaces so that we can get maximum effort. Um, so the RCTA is doing a lot to help inform like what they should look like and then we'll push that along to our colleagues in GVSC and working with AI task force to solidify what those, what those standards need to be so that we can get maximum industry involvement in that. Yeah, I guess one, one additional thing is there are a lot of conceptual and architectural similarities, okay, between systems, but, but there's not a, a formalized standard in what I think you mean by that. Yeah. So the industry has standards, but they're not standard. Exactly. I think yeah, one of the problems is yeah. that many of the algorithms we're we talking about here, like the perceptual algorithms and, and these kind of pieces, are really still at the, at the research stage. And yeah. as we know, research groups, they, they use whichever tool is out there that they can build on top. That's kind of the, the easiest first step. And ROS is one of the one that's being used a lot. Um, sometimes people just because there's no great alternative out there. Um, for example, NVIDIA is developing an SDK that's more geared toward... Um, high-speed GPU computation, but, but again, I think at this point, yeah, there's just nothing that the whole community fully agrees upon. Uh, in an attempt to make this discussion even more depressing, uh, <laughs> I, w I want to point out that uh, standards are not only about software and software architectures, they're also about data mm -hmm. uh, and how to represent data, how to share data, how to transfer data, how to reuse it, uh, issues of privacy in particular in the safe driving uh, uh, area. Uh, the government, I believe, NIST uh, issued an RFI request for information a couple of months ago exactly on, on that topic. So the fact that uh, the reason I have from NIST uh, is evidence that this is still a work, very much a work in progress. Yeah, yeah. You, you don't request information on something that already exists. So, uh, other uh, questions? Must be one or two. I think I saw uh, a hand shoot up. No. Um, okay. Well, I guess uh, would you have, did you have a follow up? Yeah. Okay. So this question is on, uh, I guess, the interactive piece. Uh, it's not clear to me where we are in regards to uh, the, 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 the algorithms generating a model and then the, the machine learning system knowing what's missing in that model and then tell the human what's missing in the, in the model. Um, so, you know, kind of have these systems figure out what they're missing and, and, and kind of and ask for more information from the human. So I don't know if there's research being done in that area or someone can elaborate on that. Yeah, that is a, a huge problem. In fact, this is related to what Dieter mentioned in uh, introspection. Uh, that is the system being able to understand uh, its own performance and understand what is missing in its, in its performance. Uh, and there is research in this area. DARPA, for example, just launched a program called Comp Competency Aware System. Mm -hmm. uh, part of it is uh, being, on, uh, I mean, the system means self-aware of its own uh, performance and, if you will, its own uh, weaknesses. Um, so that's, that's a step in that, in that direction, yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah, it's a it's a difficult one because humans are terribly bad at uh, understanding the information that they're missing. So right back there, yes. So I'm sorry. Larry, Larry Matthews, JPL. I've been a participant in the program. I just thought it was a good opportunity to ask Tony, uh, since robots for the military ultimately need to work day night, all weather, all season. If you can give us any insight into where industry is at with that range of environmental co conditions. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's certainly uh, very difficult uh, to uh, field a self-driving uh, car that can operate in all weather, all conditions. And um, so um, uh, really the approach we're taking is uh, since we uh, control the vehicles, in other words, they'd be part of our network, we can selectively deploy them. So we can start by deploying them only in good weather conditions. Uh, only in easy environments uh, and, and work our way up from there. Uh, that allows us to realize the, uh, the potential of self-driving vehicles uh, long before we solve the entire problem. Uh, but the entire problem itself, meaning a self-driving car that can operate anywhere, anytime, all conditions, uh, is, uh, is a ways off. 
Can you um, specify or elaborate a little bit on a ways off? Could you like 10, 20 years? <laughs> I, know, I know people hate to do that, and yet that is uh, a useful information. <clears throat> uh, yeah, it's very difficult to estimate that uh, and uh, 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 to solve the entire problem. Uh, I would say is years off, uh, and uh, I've I've made estimates in in the past, and uh, I've been wrong. Uh, so <laughs> so uh, perhaps I shouldn't make another guess. Okay, what was the wrong one? <laughs> Which answer. one? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, all right. Other questions? Uh, I think we've got time for maybe one more. So if you were holding back, uh, you know, now's your shot. Um, uh, oh, we do. We have one. Yes, right here in front. Thank you. Oh, wait, wait for the mic, please. And, and affiliation, helpful. Thank you. Don Rego from the Army. I, I have a comment slash hopefully lead to a question about the issue of trust and black box mentality. And I've looked at the outputs of these things for as long as anybody. And the thing that's most troubling about them is they change their mind from frame to frame. And, you know, and ostensibly, you've got the same image and, you know, from frame to frame the output will differ. And I think the thing that's going to erode confidence the most is something that appears to change its mind in an um, indiscriminate way. So is there something we can do in algorithm development to make those outputs more consistent? Yeah, I fully agree that that's, of course, a big problem, right? If you, if you see a video, for example, or something like that, and from one frame to the next, it just doesn't know what the previous frame, how it analyzed that anymore, uh, or at least seemingly. I think um, on the one hand side, yeah, we can do a lot, of course, on, the, on how we train these systems. So for example, one, uh, one common thread is that we see a lot of what's called domain randomization, which means we train these systems so that they are robust to changes in lighting conditions and to other kind of changes in the coloring and in the scene. And I think as we train them on a higher variety of scenes, then they will become more and more robust. And also incorporating um, techniques that, that we've known from the more traditional settings, kind of temporal reasoning, so that they learn to be more consistent over time. I think th those kind of things will, of course, increase uh, the quality of these. And in the end, yeah, we might always face this problem that um, a human looks at the output and says, like, hmm, that's not intuitive, that doesn't make sense to me. And, and that's a general problem we'll have to face, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, folks, I, by my clock, it's uh, been an hour, and I want you to please join me in thanking these panelists for their insight today. Thank you so much, guys. <laughs>